My name is Tom Link, and I teach psychology here at Pierce College in uh, Fort Stillicum campus in Lakewood, Washington. So in order to see, we have two brains that are real brains. They're, they're obviously dead. Um, and the first thing we do is let you, we're going to pull them out and let you take a look at them. The lab requirements are... Uh, Lab Supervisor Robert Thyssen is here. You need goggles and gloves. And welcome and thank you for coming. For the record, these are students in Biology 241, right? Yes. And Aaron Carrera is here, the S support Supplemental Instructor for 241. And thanks to Elad and Kyle for doing a lot of the coordination and providing good ideas about filming. These are put in formaldehyde. These are one of the few things that are now still kept in, in, in and formalin. Uh, some people have a formaldehyde allergy or reaction. Um, it's not the brain itself, it's the storage piece. You'll note that we're in here because this has a good ventilation system. If you've noticed a response to new rugs or new mattresses, those are the ones that usually off-gas formaldehyde. If at any time you, you feel it all light, um, you can step outside. And there's also an eye wash station right there. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, so there are two complete brains that have been cut slightly differently. So this one is just in a left and right hemisphere. Um, and part of what we want to do is kind of dab it and so that it's the formaldehyde that really makes it a mess. And then we want to leave it uh, over the, the trays with the, the wax. Um, over time, there'll be very little of the formaldehyde. You'll, so you can come pick it up. Notice to be gentle. Remember, there, it's hard to get new brains. Uh, these days. Are there volunteers? Ha ha ha. Okay. Um, but like this part here is only held on right there. It's not held there. So that's one to always sort of support like the baby's head. Feel free to pick it up, look around, look at it. You can, do we have the little uh, pointer and poker, the little yeah, silver? Okay. Oh, perfect. Right. Feel free to do that. You don't want to, you can see over time that it's, some of it's gotten a little chewed up from people being too forceful, but you can notice that there's an actual crease in there. Um, maybe lift this up. So feel free to do that if you want to take What else? So you guys notice anatomical things. Anything else about the shape or structure of it that just sort of stands out? Maybe that's different than the pictures that you're used to seeing. Um, well, when we had the sheep, I don't know if it's going to be huge. I noticed a lot more of these running through of it. Mm -hmm. And those are? Uh, nerves. Arteries and veins, actually. Good guess. The nerves, these are actually piles of nerve cells. They're so small. Yeah, it's a little. That's, no, that's right. That's why we want to do this. If we do this and throw it away, it gets better over time. Thank you. Excellent. So these are actual real brain slices, too. So this is the outside. So you can see it going in. The cortex, our cover, literally includes this, this, this. This is all what they call the outside. And you can see it here as well, folded in and out. You can see that this looks different than that. That's one of the things to know. The other one is the pawns. I don't know if you guys would be required to know that. Mm -hmm. See how it's, you can actually see the difference? So this is the first TED Talk I was ever introduced to years ago. This is Jill Bolte-Taylor. And it's, uh, she's, uh, she's a brain scientist. She's, she studies, I forget what exactly. And she studied it because her brother has schizophrenia and she wanted to understand the brain. So she has this personal professional connection. Then she has a stroke. And one of the thoughts, if you go into science, you will understand this. If not, just know that we're crazy. She's like, during the stroke, she's like, oh my god, I can't believe it. I'm a, a brain scientist and I get to see what a stroke's like from the inside. She has this stroke. Um, as you know, it, it causes physical issues. It causes, but for her, the stroke was on her uh, left side, which had, do you guys know this? I don't know how much function you guys are mostly um, structure. Where does language get processed? Left side or right side of the cortex? Any idea? Left side. Left side. Left side. It, you it, it, it's flipped aside. It's a, so the left side is more sequential. The right side is more all at once. Okay. So, so she has the, the brain here. So first she can't read words. Then, and she's trying to, she's trying to call her friend and she's, she has the business card. Then she doesn't recognize letters and numbers. The stroke, and it takes her about 40 minutes um, before she gets help. So her, her brain is, you know, uh, losing oxygen and particularly the left hemisphere side. Um, so that's kind of a neat piece. Highly recommend that one. But here's the spinal cord. Part of this I mentioned because you can see 
some things are really easy to see in real life, and the, the ponds is a surprising one, right? You, it's, it's obvious where it begins and ends, right? But the medulla, if there was a spinal cord attached, it would be right there. The medulla literally is sitting right here, and all it is is the fattening of the spinal cord. It's just more cells. Could somebody bring the one that's got, or the far table that's got the different animals? It's the tall one on the last table. Could you switch to the three brains? Oh, Aaron will do it. The three, perfect. Can you th switch to the three brain slide then? So you guys probably learn them as like uh, brain stem, limbic system, and cerebrum or cerebral cortex. We also call them old brain, limbic system, and new brain, and that has to do with evolution. And, and the best way to see it is a medulla. Now, you guys are science people. You probably know. What is a ganglion? What does that mean? This is where they meet. Huh? This is where they meet, like the coffee shop. Yeah, nice, excellent. Where a group of them get together, basically, excellent. Yeah, coffee shop's great because is a coffee shop, would you consider them a highly organized work team or just a bunch of people kind of milling about? Milling about. Right, yeah. And so a ganglion, right, it's just a pile of nerves. And if we look at these, we get, um, we go, let's see, is the wording right? Can you read that or is it backwards? Fish, carp. Fish, carp. Fish, carp. Frog. Snake. Snake. Pigeon. Pigeon. Rabbit. So if we just take, now the funny thing about this, it takes a while, the eyes are the biggest, right? The eyes are bigger than the brain. Our eye would be right about there, you know, it would be about, let's say, about the last digit of my finger there. Last part of, last what he called joint. Um, so when we call it old brain, it's because if you want to diagram like a fish brain or like, have you ever done worms? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty simple. It's like one band of cells. And as we start to move to reptiles, this is the reptile, right? It just becomes a pile. Is there much differentiation in there compared to the rabbit or the, uh, here's the sheep brain, a real one. How much, how many different kinds of parts can you see in the reptile brain? I mean, there's clearly a pile, right? There's clearly a coffee shop. Not much, not much. It looks like one big blob. And, and that's where like the medulla, and then when we come in for the rest of the brain stem here, it's a great way to recognize in the human brain something that looks ancient. Perfect. So we call them. So brain stem is the more um, uh, medical term, or and then the cerebellum is part of it. The reptilian brain for the evolutionary words, so mammalian and new mammalian or human, and sometimes old limbic and new. What's amazing when people teach you the brain, you know, in TED talks or wherever they. They almost always talk only about the limbic system and the new brain. So if you get this, you got like 90% of what professionals are teaching you about how we learn based on the brain, which is useful, but, is, but I think we can go beyond that, and I think we even will today. So this helps us see, so the reptile is like this. You see the rabbit already? Even though it's teeny, can you see a left and right hemisphere? Mm -hmm. Right? And if we could, somebody bring that one over and just put these next to, to represent the brain. So you want to hold one of them, and then you hold the other. I don't care which direction, perfect. So you see the left and right hemisphere and it looks in some ways similar. You see some folds already there, and it's a little bit more. And then here if we have the sheep, we begin to see some, say human-like or new mammalian. The other piece, watch if we fold, let this fold over. So that's the cerebral cortex. Cerebellum in Latin, probably, maybe Greek, probably Latin, means little brain. It looks like it's by itself, see, because it's hanging out like that. Right, which we have to be careful. It's attached to the brainstem only. It, it looks like it's in every model. If you look at the plastic model, they're glued together. It's one of the biggest. Now, if we compare, obviously the human brain is larger, but now specifically compare the size of the cerebellum to all of this cortex. And you can step away if you need to set that down. Um, I mean, you just look like you're, you don't have to step away. Sorry, no, it is. No. Yeah, sure. And, then, and if we just, uh, if somebody wants, we'll, we'll dab a little bit. And then here, somebody, somebody beside you should dab and throw that away. And it'll, it gets better because the ventilation's nice. If you take a step back for a second, too. It. Yeah. There you go. Fancy. Yeah, yeah. It's almost Should worth the nausea. <laughs> no, me too. So, cerebellum to cerebral cortex. Cerebellum to cerebral cortex. Does the ratio look the same? No. Which, which one has a bigger cerebellum, a bigger... Sheep does. What are sheep good at? Not, and if we go sheep, I'm going to extend sheep, deer, um, antelope, I don't you know, others. Surviving. Huh? Surviving. They're good at herding and surviving. And think about how they run. Goats are another great one, right? 
Do they, when they run, can they run over rocky soil? <coughs> do they have to look down? When you hike over a rocky thing, oh, here, have a toe. Unless you want to stand there and, like, I'm sterile. No, I wouldn't try it. Okay. No, it's all good. Um, they can do this automated mu muscle movement is, is primarily down here. Now, everything we're going to talk about in a minute or two is about pathways. A lot of people, particularly starting in the early 90s, when the most, um, a big wave of, of new antidepressants, uh, Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil came out, they had a belief that it was, a, it was so precise. One brain area did one thing. There was a depression area. There would be an anxiety area. And it, it really doesn't make sense that we're going to talk about pathways. So with that in mind, a, a key part of the basic movement pathway is, is through here. It's not the whole thing. There's a piece that starts up here. It comes down here. If you've heard of the striatum, it's in there. But this is a nice piece because it coordinates a lot of that stuff. For you, if you're, if you're walking, do you have to think about walking? If you've seen a 16-month-old, do they think about walking? Watch their eyes. They're really thinking, right? They're wobbling and doing this. And usually your first step is like you fall and catch yourself. So that's going to be, for them, you would see more activity up here in the motor cortex. And that for us, it slowly manages here. If you've learned a sport or dancing or maybe even some uh, lab skills, right? The first time you're doing things, it's, it's going to be awkward. How do I hold this? Something falls, right? But over time, hopefully, you know, what, when you're applying to graduate school, you'll be like, you pick up the tools, and now you're just thinking about what you're going to do with them. You're no longer thinking. That pattern of activity has started being a lot more activity up here, and it's slowly there's a package of activity here. This is much better in terms of working your body because it's closer. There's amazing, surprisingly, the speed and, and the complexity matter Again, if we think of this as the spinal cord, if anything wants to get to the spinal cord, it has to come down through this way. It has to go through the brainstem. So although the brainstem is the least thinking, most instinctual, it also is the first response. If we think about the, so now we take this one, which is surviving. Psychologists don't talk about this a lot, except as how it executes the stuff up here. This is surviving movement. There's stuff in the medulla, like if you have, um, a, a brainstem stroke, you'd say, are they conscious, are they breathing? If they have, like she had a stroke up here, you say, can she talk? Um, is she making sense? Does she know where she is? Right? If it's a brainstem <clears throat> stroke, you start thinking, if it's your grandma, you start thinking, can I get time off? Because it might be the last visit, right? Whereas up here, it's not right race to the hospital, you got a little bit more time. So time, and it's because it's literally, if you just go closer to the spinal cord, quicker. First, second, and third. Now this one needs this diagram. This, we're good. So the limbic system, and this is one of the hardest ones to see. So there's the limbic system, which is in the middle. And this one actually has the thalamus. You guys heard about the thalamus yet? It's the easiest one to see. It's this big thing. But when you take it out, oops, let me turn on our show. Yeah, we'll keep that in. The thalamus look like two big walnuts. There's one on each side. The, the, the limbic system comes around. It's not technically part of it, but it's, and then we have the cerebral cortex. Now, when I taught these diagrams and the one you usually see in psychology for about 15 years, I thought the limbic system was inside, not part of the cortex. It's actually the inner part of the cortex. Now, can we get the other, get that one over here? Because that one has a nice slice this way. And then we want to go to, there's one with the two little heads. That, perfect. This is Wikipedia, three dimensional. Have you seen these? These are great, Wikipedia, three dimensional. And you can get them for almost every area. So you notice again how they're in the middle. So this one's more of a bulb. And the hippocampus is literally like, right, this is the hippocampus and the amygdala is in front of it. OK, so now go to, I think, the next slide. And we got this one. So these are useful because they cut this way. And you've learned coronal, sagittal, and blah, blah, blah. OK, excellent. Um, I go this, this, and this. Because here's the thing. Some of this knowledge you'll use in the lab. Some of this knowledge you'll use in the emergency room when your friend is just wiped out from snowboarding or, or uh, parkour or whatever it is they do that hurts them. Oh, you, you know what it was eight, ten years ago? Heelys. So many right injuries. That, uh, friends of mine who are nurse practitioners and doctors are like, God, just full of that. So. You know, you can memorize the terms and that's good, but you know, the part of your brain that will be working in the emergency room, if it's your friend or your mom or your kid, right, will not be the cortex first. It'll be the limbic system first. The limbic system is more, okay, so physically, 
So first, you can see what's cool here. Pointer. Um, thank you. Look at both point. Point this out. Here's the thalamus. It's easy to see. It's a nice big fat one. The thalamus is right there. There's some of the uh, basal ganglia below it, but the thalamus is there. Now notice that although it looks like just a fat solid mass, it comes out here, it comes out there. So if you want to see the lobes, right? You had to learn temporal lobe, frontal. Pro the temporal lobe, the brain's thumb, although it looks like, see, from here you can't tell. You go here, this all is clearly coming out that way. This one's coming down and like that. Huge difference. I, I can't do this because, again, you do that once and your brain's ruined. But uh, you can see the difference. The limbic system is actually part of the cerebral cortex, particularly the hippocampus and amygdala are this part here. This is more hippocampus because we're where we are in the brain, say right here. Amygdala is going to be about there, and I think I have. Oh, perfect. Excellent. So <laughs> this is um, about six or there's about nine slides from front to back. The amygdala, these are slides two and three, so it's right near the front. You can tell because you see no cerebellum. You'll see cerebellum and spinal cord in the other ones. Um, the thalamus, oh, you know I brought a pointer. Is it in my bag? There should be a little pointer with a hand just for that purpose. Excellent, excellent, thank you. This we can clean. So, there's no cerebellum or spinal cord. Again, you can see really beautifully this piece here. Now, the amygdala and these two pieces, get out of the way, ah, there's my head. You can see it's kind of like a ball. And even from one slice to the other, it switches amazingly. Like that one already starts to look hippocampus-like. So two and three, so like one is like here, two, three. And then we go to the next slide, it's I think like five and six or six and seven. Here's the hippocampus, so it's this area, it's this tucked in part right here. And so, put that there, Let's see if we can remember that. And so now we can see it in here, and it's really, it's so interesting. So the hippocampus, well here, you tell me, you saw it there, somebody want to point? We got two pointers. Where do you think it is? Hold it, you get two shots at it. One for either side. Well, you, that's kind of basal, go out more. So remember it's, one of you, hold that one. Thank you. Okay, you keep pointing. So remember, this is the. See, this is uh, this is all wavy and curly, or like spaghetti, and this is solid. So this is actually either thalamus. I think that's thalamus, and below that would be basal ganglia. But it's going to come out here, and then up and in, curled inside. Yeah, you hold there. You go. Yeah. Oh, here. It'll be help if you hold it that way. Come down that way. And then up and inside. That's outside. Inside. inside. So it's right up in, right in that area here. I know it looks, and this is the thing, if you, each slide looks different. That's why I picked out a bunch of slides. So those are the best. This is just where somebody cut a brain, right? You know what I'm saying? So it becomes more of a, a ball-like thing towards the end, but it's right in there. And you can see even on left and right are different. See this right here, this whole business up in here, right? So the, so the hippocampus and amygdala are part of the limbic system on the lower inside. If we look at the rest of the limbic system, it's basically, that one's really chewed up. This one's a little better. Let's see. So I tell you what, you tell, I'll show you and you tell me if it's better. Um, and so we want to get it on this side of the tape, roughly. Keep moving. All right. Uh, Oh, this is nice. So this is, this is the most chewed up corpus callosum right there. God, that barely looks like it matches, but it does. This is really chewed up corpus callosum. But, and, and so the corpus callosum is the one that runs left to right. And that's why I said it's easier to see. When, when people see the normal drawing that, like this in psych books, the corpus callosum just looks like a, a I don't know, like a piece of, uh, piece of Play-Doh that you build into a snake. Oops. But what it really is when you see it here, and that one's, so if we could keep it all there, right? It, it runs this way and it runs from the center of this side to the center of the other side. So a little beat up. That's a good reason to do it on tape, right? I hope it's, it wasn't this beat up 20 years ago. But so, the last time we cleaned out the tanks, right? There was there were little bits of brain floating in it. 
Um, just saying. So this flood, and this is where nerve cells travel the fastest in the brain, right? It's literally the back and forth. So we talk about the left and right brain. We're really talking about the left and right cerebral cortex. But unless you're unless it's cut, your corpus callosum is cut, which only happens as a last resort in uh, epilepsy. Um, it's so fast that you don't experience it the way people say, oh, left-handed people are on the right side of their brain. Well, you, we're talking about like for milliseconds, and then the information's back and forth. Above that here, so this, and this is why I think I was showing other people, just some of you, but I want to highlight, so you can see, can you see the color difference? And each one's a little, let's see, those are pretty good. Right? What is the, where are the dark, and then you can also see it well here in these slides here. It's this, let's see, I think this will get the camera too. So can you see how it goes dark and light, light and dark, light and dark? So when we say cortex, which means cover, it means the outside of the cerebrum. But because it's folded, and it'll be really important for pathways, the outside is actually all of this and this and that, all of this darker stuff, what they call gray matter. You learn gray and white matter? Mm -hmm. All right, there's a gray white matter slide after the amygdala ones. Um, the outside is really all of these outsides, and really this inner part <laughs> is outside. You see, this is gray. It doesn't look like, right? This is, could you hold that like that for me? Yeah. Thanks. And then put your hand under. Yeah. Perfect, thanks. Right? This is inside, but this is outside, that's outside, this is outside, that's outside, inside, outside. That's more complicated, right? But here, this is actually outside. What they're trying to do is get a lot of lines going in the same direction. Uh, have you ever seen the movies of like um, cars go, going through a crosswalk in like 1900 where there's like 15 cars going from every direction just randomly? Yeah, imagine if your nerve cells did that. How would your, what would it look like? You'd have a lot of activity. High five in the afternoon. <laughs> Yeah. I five at the five, 16 interchange during construction, right? <laughs> On a rainy night with a little fog, right? Perfect, yeah. <laughs> but again, get rid of all the signs. Have, cr have people going at a direct 90 degree angle across I five, right? That's the problem. The primary goal of the nervous system is to have pathways that can then connect these areas. So this piece allows us to have this a long, a really long complex, well, it's just really big surface area of outer layer. Each one of these outer layer pieces um, is processing bits of information. The white, this is white matter, which is now white plus formaldehyde or let's say tan, I don't know. Um, and I think one of these has it, let's see, yeah, that's a diagram, and then this is, um, this is also, but this has also been killed and preserved. I don't know, you probably don't say killed in biology, you probably say something more sanitary. But again, you can see the outer layer, outer layer, outer layer, and that these, and you can even begin to see the lines here. You won't see the lines here. These nerve cells are very, very short, and these are mostly long. These have a lot of axons, and the axons are... Uh, are what's the covering of, of, of axons? Myelin. myelin, excellent. What does the myelin do? Speeds up. Speeds up, right, yeah, excellent. Like coating a wire. Like you could leave wires across, but again, yeah, like the, like think about the coffee shop. If, if everybody's just randomly sitting and there's no lines, right? People are bumping each other, coffee's getting spilled. Wires are leaning across each other. As far as I know, they can, they can jump. So the, um, the, the gray matter has very, very short axons that are unmyelinated, and it's actually the myelination that causes the change. You can see, if you look online, some they can stain the myelin, and you guys know more about staining than I do, to make it different colors for different purposes. Um, if we have time, I'll show you the cool piece from a Scientific American article of a, a rodent um, uh, hippocampus that's, that shows the, the central piece, and it's just really cool. So we've got gray and white. Uh, let me just pause. Any thoughts, questions? Anything you want to point out or have pointed out to you? Because I, I just start talking and then I'm not sure what you know, what you don't know, what you care about. What you and there know. was one slide. Um, it was empty. Was that where the corpus callosum got cut out? Good guess. No, that's actually where the ventricles are. Oh, um, thanks. No, these are actually empty spaces in the brain. In this case, the... Uh, Feel free to remind me which thing I'm using. Um, <laughs> the corpus callosum is right above there. There's empty space in the brain. Why do you think there's empty space from a practical standpoint? Let's say your kid's going to play football or 
something. Why would you have empty space? You said cushions. Yes. Cushion, exactly. And if you want a cushion, would you leave it with air or would you? Fluid, fluid right? It's got, it's got, um, mm -hmm. say that out loud for the camera. Uh, CFS. Which stands for? Cerebral, Cerebral spinal fluid. fluid. Excellent. There's a really neat case, uh, a sad but powerful case of a guy named Clive Waring. He was a famous musician in London, and it was about God, 20 years ago now, and he had actually viral encephalitis. You know what a virus is, right? Encephalo is, stands for encephalo. He was British, so they call it encephalo. Encephalo means Brain. head, and itis means Sickness in flame, specifically. Itis means something's growing. So just like the fluid in your sinus cavities, you know, if you have sinusitis, this fluid grew. Unfortunately, the symptoms for the first three or four days looked just like uh, headaches. And, and, and his wife says on the morning of the third day, he couldn't remember his daughter's name. And so now they go, right? So what happens is the pressure there, and this also happens if you have any of the strokes where there's, or, or anywhere where there's bleeding in the brain, you're going to get pressure because the brain is so, the, the skull is solid after the first few months, but uh, the brain is not, so it grows and it presses. So he primarily lost the hippocampi because they were right. There's more. There's um, there are four ventricles. These are the big ones. There's one there that's called a horn because it looks like a horn, and then there's one in here, and so it pushed there. And by the time they figured it out, those were basically permanently damaged. The limbic system does two things. One, it controls the basic fight or flight. So we have, going back to the reptilian brain, keeps you alive, instinctual, doesn't do much. I mean, doesn't change much in response to the environment, right? What you have in the medulla, by and large, is what you should have. And you had it as a baby. I mean, yeah, I mean, do you think about the breathing and, you know, and breathe and breathe? No. Then we have the limbic system, which does the fight or flight. The basic, is it dangerous or not? Now, we all have that same basic system, but what triggers it? We will learn and grow over the hippocampus. It will grow in the hippocampus based on experience. We think of triggers and post-traumatic stress disorders the most obvious. In your experience, if the teacher's rambling along, blah, 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 which will be on the test, what happens in your head? I focus. And unfortunately, you're like trying to remember the sentence before. Like, it's like it'd be nice if they'd say test and then say the sentence, right? Because it gives you, and, and you've learned that. You, didn't, you weren't born, you know, go back 15 generations and the word test was a trigger, no. Or if your experience was different than yours and you had a, an unfortunate experience and now it, there just happened to be bright yellow, bright sun and there was three or four people around and they all had kind of square shoulders. Now that kind of outline is actually stored in the limbic system as a trigger, as, as matching the incoming memories. So here's where we've got the, uh, the hippocampus, which is sitting right in here, and then the thalamus right there. You can almost see it underneath this right in there, the rounded part there, and you can see it easily in here right there, right? The thalamus is a bulb sitting right in the dead center, which is a great place to coordinate information, to particularly coordinate sensory information. And it's right next to the hippocampus, which is figuring out, is this dangerous or not? One of the biggest misnomers is people think the fight or flight is fight or flight. The fight or flight system is really fight or flight or relax. Because you guys know it as the sympathetic nervous system and the, excellent, the sympathetic nervous system. Are they attached to the same organs and limbs? Yeah, yeah but they do different things. What does the symp sympathetic nervous system do? When it's attached to the liver and kidneys, did you, is this too hard a question? No, yeah. I think they might have just recently covered this. Yeah, I think so it's, it's the fight or flight, right? Right. So the sympathetic is, if there's alarm, what does your body do? Are you going to spend time processing stuff in your liver and kidneys? Yes. Yeah. It reacts by... It creates adrenaline. It creates the adrenaline, right? Huh? Reflexes. Certain kinds of reflex. Watch this. So having your body move quickly and, and um, forcefully is a good reflex to have during danger. The reflexes of digesting in your liver and intestines and kidneys, right? That's reflex too. Or do you sit there and think and make your kidneys, hmm, no, more bile production. No. Right. Is it, wouldn't it be amazing if you could? You probably could, you know, the pe anyway, nowadays the people have like the, the thing. I know, you know, people with diabetes and they just, they, it runs to their smartphone, gives them a continuous a glucose reading. Theoretically, you could, but that's for another day. Um, 
So if the fight or flight is activated, what it does is it stops your internal organs from doing it. This is why animals poop and we just feel congested. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, there's, there's a joke about a captain with brown pants, if you know that, uh, and red <laughs> pants and brown pants. Uh, but, uh, but you stop digesting. This is why they say don't go swimming right after you've eaten, because if you get nervous, you do the muscle movement, if you cramp, you could die. I mean, you shouldn't run afterwards either, but you stop running and you're on ground, so it's not as critical a situation. So the limbic system, if it signals sympathetic danger, either fight or flight, which are both responses to danger, it's, we stop doing the gut stuff, liver, intestines, kidneys, etc. We send off the adrenaline from the uh, uh, adrenal glands. And it sends all of the body from the, from all of the energy from the blood system f away from there to your outer limbs. So you can move and do stuff here. So you have those reflexes, but your reflexes of digestion are poorer. And one of the things Western science is great at is, is discrete injuries in little areas. But what we're not good at is systemic ones. If you undergo <laughs> regular stress, think about the pressure it's putting and you're starting your digestive system and stopping it, starting it and stopping it, starting it and stopping it before it's finished. You know, if you stop the washer or the dishwasher mid-cycle a bunch of times, it's not going to go well, is it? That's the kind of piece. So sympathetic says take it away from the major muscle groups and put it back to the ongoing maintenance features. In addition to liver and kidneys, I'm sure white, white cells and other things like that are happening, but you guys will know that better than I, so I will leave that to your expertise. So the limbic system is right next to the thalamus. The thalamus helps organize the sensory areas to say what key features. Because the limbic system, although it can learn and respond to the environment, it's simpler than the, the cortex, right? It's quicker than the cortex, but simpler. If you know test anxiety, same thing, right? If you read the first t question of the test, you're like, <gasps> which you shouldn't do when you're breathing formaldehyde. That was, <laughs> that was a poor choice. <laughs> You'll finish the lecture, right? <laughs> I pass out. Um, but, right, so that's your limbic system saying danger, danger. The problem is all of the knowledge that you learn in college is here. What one woman, um, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, and she's talking about ACEs and chronic stress and the impact on the brain. She says, you know, that's a great reaction if you're in the forest and there's a bear. What if the bear comes home every night? What if the bear is your father, or your teacher, or people in the neighborhood? Right? That's, it's being triggered on an ongoing basis. The limbic system is being triggered and the amygdala, the amygdala actually sends the signal to the, to the, um, um, to the adrenal glands. The hippocampus is the one that stores those basic memories. The second thing it does is actually serves as a pathway because it's right here. If you're going to make memories coming out to the memories in the other areas. And this is the complex thing about pathways. Let's see. How's that? I don't know. There's, there's different places I could go. Questions, thoughts, examples? Okay, we'll go pathways. So go to that red one first. So if it's white area, thank you. <laughs> Give me a high one. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. If it's like this, it's going to be it's going to be myelinated, so it's white matter. And these are just this is back from the uh, uh, Gray's Gray's Anatomy back from uh, 1917, which is uh, out of copyright, so it's it's free to use. It's just gorgeous, and if you look at some of the original drawings, I mean, it's it's just beautiful. It's you know, I went to a neurologist, a guy, uh, a physiatrist, who called. He had pictures of the Gray's Anatomy on his. The, he called it a love story. You know, that's, yeah. so now notice how it's also going. So this is the, uh, it's going into the little nodules there. This is the gray matter, right? This is the outside, 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 because it's curving around. This is taking the product. So you're going to organize some information in there, take it over here. Now it takes that information that's also coming from here, sends it out there. So once it gets over here, maybe it joins this pathway, starts going there and there. So when we talk about anything that's really interesting and relevant, we don't want to talk about, am I a limbic system person or a cortex person? We talk about what's the conversation between the two. To make it more complicated, it's the one with the really complicated one. Or actually, uh, at the, with all the colors near the end. Oh, back to three. There you go. I just made this last night, finally. I've been trying to put all the areas to think about. So these are different areas on the outside. These are, some, these are the, the, this is the key 
limbic system areas, the hippocampus and the amygdala. This will be important to say. So, but just to show you a bunch of different areas, the senses are the most obvious, right? We have, if you move, it's this. If you touch, it's this. The amazing thing is that they're, well, it's kind of cool that they're next to each other. So like the face is right about here. So if, if you want to move your, if you want to smile, maybe you move right here. But if somebody pokes you in the lips for some weird reason, you would feel it here. So there's a parallel. Then they have this area that's about planning to move where you imagine, and if you've ever done visualization in sports or arts and dance and stuff, that's where that happens. Some of the neat research on that is a, called something called mirror neurons, where if you're planning to move, partly if, so one monkey is watching another monkey, and when it's, it seems before it moves to do the similar movement, you see some activity in there that seems to be matching and is trying to imagine itself doing. So this kind of learning and modeling and maybe even a beginning, a rudimentary kind of empathy if I can literally walk a mile in your shoes, to pardon the, the pun, that would be happening in this area here. On, on the left side, for almost everybody, not everybody, it's complicated, we have the speech areas and they're in variations of green here. I want to separate that sound is processed and then speech is next to it. Turning sound into speech is a big deal. Turning, there's a separate place just for if you're reading. Yes, ma'am. Hey, Faith, right? Hey. That's gorgeous. That's a gorgeous piece. Excellent. So if you wanted the center of the pathway, it, it would be here. This is the heart of the pathway. So it's got a, um, there are sounds, they're putting words, and then you have all these areas that aren't marked. And they're sometimes called association areas or coordination areas. And if we just wanted to know, if we wanted to kill your inner voice, you probably, if you got rid of the brocus area, no, no, not the, sorry. I pointed the wrong spot. This is understanding. This is producing. It's Broca's area. It's named after the guy, Paul Broca. This is Wernicke's area named after a German. It's a W, but Wernicke. Um, so it would be, if we wanted to destroy it, if you got rid of that, and I don't know. There's a guy named Oliver Sacks who has interesting cases. And he, and he gives an example of Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia. But I don't remember him saying that about it. The guy with Broca's aphasia, he could understand what people said, but he couldn't say stuff. So imagine how, how like trapped in your mind you are, right? Because you know it makes sense, but when you say stuff, it makes nonsense. One of the things that he was able to do was sing, because sing is more pattern, right? Language is sequential. You can only say one word or sentence at a time, but art and math is, 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 is uh, you represent a whole set of things at once. Like if you look at a picture, if you're identifying, oh, there's a chair. Oh, it's this kind of this. Oh, I recognize this, this kind of stroke work. That looks, I don't know, early French period, let's say, of something. Um, that's all sequential. That's more left brain stuff. If you look at it overall and notice what kind of scene it is, notice the mood, notice the, the set of things that where things feel they go together, that's more of a right brain thing. So sequential word after word, that's probably in the Broca's area. But the content of it is coordinating from all the other areas, right? The content of it is organizing and doing the pieces. So if you had damage in, in some of these areas here or here or here, so remember the hippocampus on the inside, some of the memories, particularly that are stored um, short term, like a few days, what, you know, if you have a, um, if you get a concussion, right? Anybody had a severe concussion? No, well, good for you. Go play football, you know, Heelys, you know. Uh, dirt bike racing, most, most accidents per time spent in a sport, more than football, should you choose. You know, a lot of broken bones. Um, you'll lose what was in your hippocampus, which is usually the, the last minute to three minutes, and you never get that back. What a lot of people, though, is they'll lose about three days, a, you know, one hour to three days, and that's sitting in the temporal lobe. So when you think about what's in your thoughts, some of it comes out of nowhere, like stuff I haven't thought in 20 years. But a lot of it's stuff that's related to things you were thinking about an hour ago or an hour before, you know. So if we, if we hit the temporal lobe, you would probably get a, the content of it would be less well-jointed and less, less relevant. So now we get that great example of pathways where you have all kinds of memories in different areas. You have it sort of organizing and floating around, and then you have it turned into words. And you know that going from here to speech, you have five thoughts and you try to get one out. That's a problem in a simple terms from the Broca's area, right in, down into basically your, your mouth. Oh, 
just on that. You know, we often teach babies sign language at about eight months, whereas their usual first spoken word is about a year. Not when? When did you say? No, it could be right. I mean, these are estimates. You see, no, I said like their first actual word, not. Oh, <laughs> oh, what did you say? Like, oh, like mom. Mom, yeah. perfect. Yeah, because so at eight or nine months, they can understand words. Brocus area, verticus area are at a where, but coordinating between Broca's area and and the cerebellum. Thank you. Right, it takes a village to point a brain. Uh, the cerebellum, right? This is moving the throat is actually fairly complicated. You know this if you tried to trill R's and you grow up in a language that didn't trill R's. I, I took students to Korea, man, and the, you know, the, the J and G sounds are just they're all a little different. Very hard to redo this, but symbolically. Oh, by the way, the first two words you usually teach. Anybody know sign language? More and all done. Think about why those are useful. Once you get the thing, you can get more, you know, more Cheerios, more milk, more loving, less loving, more whatever, right? They're very functional words. Um, yeah, so those are some of the big things. Um, I don't know, so you, you want to touch them more and, 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 and see how they feel, kind of move and see. Um, I don't know, is there anything else you want?